Welcome to Module 9.1, uh, which is a case study looking at genetics and the use of it in conservation management of the Tasmanian devil. I'm Carolyn Hogg from the University of Sydney. And of course, today I wanted to talk about these cute little critters, the Tasmanian devils, which are now known as the world's largest marsupial carnivore after the extinction of the Tasmanian tiger or thylacine back in 1936 in Hobart Zoo. Now, Tasmanian devils, males uh, range from about 7 to 10 kilos and females are about 5 to 8 kilos in size. Uh, their breeding season, like uh, most a lot of marsupials, is quite seasonal. It runs generally from February to March, but can extend out all the way to June or July. They mate for up to eight days uh, and have a very short pregnancy of about 18 days. And although they can produce up to 30 embryos at a time, they have only got four nipples in the pouch, and so they only end up with four pouch young. And juvenile dispersal tends to occur uh, between December and January every year. Uh, and they tend to live up for a, a period of up to five years in, in non-diseased areas. So Tasmanian devils actually went extinct on the Australian mainland about 3,000 years ago and now are solely restricted to the island state of Tasmania. And they've been through a number of unexplained population crashes over the past 20,000 years which has led them to have very low inherent genetic diversity, and they're now listed as endangered. So as many of you will be aware, Tasmanian devils are listed as endangered due to devil facial tumour disease, which is a highly infectious disease. And it starts out as a tiny little pimple on the lower bottom lip, as you can see here, and then these pimples can grow into very large tumours, which can actually cause the animals to uh, either starve to death or asphyxiate. Now, devil facial tumour disease uh, first emerged in 1996 up in the north uh, east of Tasmania at Wakalina, um, Mount William National Park, and then spread very slowly uh, south and westwards across the state, leaving local declines of up to about 95% and about 80% population decline across uh, the entire state of Tasmania as it is. And now the disease is starting to move its way right up into the northwestern area, which is uh, Woolnorth, which has always historically been known as a disease-free area. However, it is very close to the Woolnorth area now, uh, and we're not quite sure what's happening down in the southwest of the state. Now, DFTD is actually restricted only to Tasmanian devils. Uh, it's highly infectious, and it directly requires direct contact to occur between individuals. The incubation period of the disease is still unknown, and uh, although we do say there's no diagnostic tests, the Menzies Medical Research Institute in, from the University of Tasmania are inching closer to having a diagnostic test available. And once lesions appear, we say that they're nearly always fatal, and the reason for that is, is there has been a number of small uh, number of individuals with tumour regressions uh, in recent years. And unfortunately, a second cancer, which we now call DFT2, um, arose in 2012. Now, so there's, there's actually two forms of, of infectious cancer, DFT1, which is the original one, which rose in 1996, and DFT2, which is in 2012. And most of what I'm going to talk today when I talk about DFTD is, is going to be about what we know about DFT1. Both of uh, DFT1 and DFT2, however, are clonal uh, cell lines. And this is work that was done by Janine Deacon and Kathy Belov back in the late uh, 2000s, and where they looked at uh, the normal devil chromosome assembly. And when you look at DFT1 strain, you can see that the chromosomes have basically reshattered and reformed into a number of mutated chromosomes and other bits and pieces have shifted uh, in the chromal uh, rearrangements inside the cancer itself. Now, the tumour is clonal, as I said, and we do know it arose from a Schwann cell and a female devil, and we know that because it does, in fact, have an X chromosome, and we know that DFT2 arose from a male devil because it has a Y chromosome. And what Liz Murchison at Cambridge University has now shown is that one female devil, we believe, bit about five or six other individuals and transmitted the disease uh, between one individual to, to another, and that's literally how this massive uh, epidemic commenced. So Kathy Belov and myself have been working on Tasmanian devils for a long period of time at the University of Sydney, and we've used a range of different genetic and genomic techniques uh, to inform management decisions, from having a reference genome to using RNA or transcriptomic data uh, to investigate both the devil's genetic diversity as well as the genetic diversity of the disease. Uh, we've studied the microbiome or the little microbes in the pouch. We've done a GWAS or a genome-wide association studies to understand what's happening with tumour regressions. <laughs> 
And we've even been under, uh, investigating some of the antimicrobial peptides that are produced in the pouch uh, and the milk of the female devils. And, and we suspect that has something to do with uh, juvenile devils not actually getting DFTD from their mothers. And a lot of this information has fed into management decisions. Now, Kathy and I started working together when I was still at the Zealand Aquarium Association. And what we wanted to do was move away from this very traditional conservation research approach where you had a research idea, got funding, undertook the research. Research may be published, it may be implemented, there may be a management outcome, which may lead to a conservation outcome. And what we wanted to know is if we work together with managers and academics hand in hand, kind of what we want to do with the Threatened Species Initiative, is could we take those management questions and feed them directly into a different series of research ideas? Could that management funding be used to leverage research funding? And could we uh, have direct consultation between the academic researchers and the on the ground managers uh, throughout the program? So we could undertake adaptive management decisions, which would have more direct conservation outcomes in real time, or the academics and the students went on to publish their research findings. And this has actually been a highly successful program with Tasmanian Devils and really was the first precursor to the Threatened Species Initiative. So when we look at what's happened uh, with conservation management for the Tasmanian Devil Program, it's really about the Tasmanian Devil metapopulation. And the metapopulation is really a movement of specific individuals between known populations to ensure the long-term survival and conservation of a species. And we like to say it's on a clinal range from ex situ of intensive zoos, through to managed environmental enclosures, which are small enclosures uh, in captivity, to larger free range enclosures, uh, usually down in Tasmania, to a fence peninsula and islands, which are about 100 to 300 hectares in size, and of course, to the wild populations. And, uh, and we move animals uh, between those uh, using a different range of number of different quarantine, depending on where the animals are getting moved to and from. So what we call the insurance metapopulation actually commenced back in 2006 and still goes today. Uh, there was about 28 devils in four zoos in 2006. And there were a number of series of intakes between 2006 and 2008, predominantly from uh, the western portion of uh, Tasmania. But this was upgraded to a full metapopulation in 2011 when we uh, worked out we had about 164 founding animals represented in the insurance metapopulation and over 700 devils are now present in captivity uh, across a range of about 37 zoos, three free range enclosures came on board in 2010. The large managed environmental enclosures up at Aussie Ark came on board in 2011. Rye Island uh, came into the population in 2012, 2013, and the Forest Deer Peninsula and the four wild sites that I'm going to be talking about today as part of the trial Wild Devils Recovery Project. So one of the first things that we did when we started to use genetics for the Tasmanian devil management is we went and investigated where all the founder devils actually came from. Uh, as you can see, a large proportion of them in the black uh, diamonds there came from the western area of, of Tasmania. And you might be able to see some white circles up in central Tasmania at Narantapu and one down the bottom at Hastings Cave. So those were the original uh, founder intakes between 2005 and 2008. But as our knowledge about Tasmanian devils and the disease increased, we found that we were able to start to bring animals in from a range of different areas, uh, bring them through disease quarantine and breed them into the insurance population. And so now the insurance population is really representative of, of what we find in the wild environments. One of the other things we understand about um, devils now through genetics is this is work that was done by Belinda Wright and Kathy Belloff's group, um, where she looked at the uh, genetic differences between devils on the west coast of Tasmania versus those on the east coast of Tasmania. And as you can see, there's quite a distinct separation between these two plots uh, and these animals up here uh, situated out by themselves are actually from uh, very far across at a place called uh, Macquarie Harbour, which uh, is quite uniquely separated from the, west, the rest of western Tasmania. So once we had an understanding of what was happening uh, with devil genetics, uh, particularly in the uh, insurance metapopulation, we started to investigate where we would be able to hold devils longer term in disease-free situation. 
And so devils were introduced to Mariah Island National Park. It's 115 kilometers, uh, square kilometer island off the east coast of Tasmania. And we released 15 devils there in 2012 and another 13 devils in 2013. Uh, we actually had 96% survival rate. So we only lost one individual uh, during the release and many. And unfortunately, he got uh, squashed in a wombat burrow and we think by a wombat. So what we did with Mariah Island, we had genetically sampled all the animals that we'd put out on the island and Elspeth McLennan, as part of her PhD project, started to investigate what was happening uh, with the genetic diversity of uh, the individuals that were born on the island. And so this is work that you can see from uh, Belinda's paper where we have the uh, West Coast animals and the East Coast animals and all the little light grey dots you can see on this plot are actually all the offspring that were in fact born on Mariah Island and there is very uh, large mixing between the East and Western populations um, from the mainland Tasmania. And what Elspeth then did is went and went and looked at how much of each individual actually had different bloodlines uh, and found that those individuals that had a mixing between uh, the eastern populations and the western populations had overall had higher genetic diversity than animals, whether they came from purely um, the west coast or purely from the east coast. So once we had a keen understanding of what was happening on Mariah Island, uh, the Tasmanian government then asked us uh, some questions in relation to conserving and, and undertaking the wild devil recovery project to understand how we could potentially increase gene flow within some of the wild populations. So which populations should they be starting with? Where should they be sourcing the devils from? What are the survival rates, rates upon release? And, and do they breed when released? And so we started with uh, a population up here at Stony Head uh, and we took animals from the source population down here from Mariah Island. And one of the questions we wanted to know was if we took Mariah Island release devils and we took Stony, uh, would they breed with the incumbent Stony Head devils and would we end up with a more genetically robust uh, offspring? So this is work that uh, Wan Wan Cheng and Elspeth McLennan undertook in our research group. Uh, and as you can see, over a number of years, we released the devils in uh, late 2016. You can see an increase in standardized uh, heterozygosity or genetic diversity over time. That takes a little dip, but kind of uh, is definitely vastly improved um, post-release uh, as opposed to what they were pre-release. Uh, pre and what you're looking at here in this PCOA plot, you can see the yellow dots are stony head animals, the darker uh, purpley uh, blue dots are from the animals that we released from Mariah Island or from the captive population, and the orange dots is very much uh, the hybrid offspring that have been created. So what we find when we look at um, stony head is we have released devils, we have incumbent devils, and the hybrid devils are really a mix between the two. So one of the other interesting things that we looked at uh, is not just genome-wide diversity, but we also used target capture to look at functional genes, um, at what was happening at the functional level within Tasmanian devils that were released between Stony Head and Mariah Island. And what we found is that we introduced some new genetic alleles to the population through the translocation event. And individuals that ended up with these types of genotypes had a better response to cancer, which is they have a lower uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And then we found other individuals that had uh, differences, uh, had lower fecal egg counts and also had a, a lower parasite load. And so uh, by introducing these new genetic variants into the populations, uh, we've improved the, the cancer response for the devils themselves and we've improved their overall immunity. Uh, so when the devils are, are not trying to find fight a range of different other parasites uh, and potential other diseases, as well as uh, devil facial tumor disease. One of the most interesting things and results we found from the study is that the disease does not get worse. So what happens is, although we increase the population size, you can see from the CMR analysis, we significantly increase the population size uh, through the release process. The uh, frequency of disease between affected and unaffected uh, individuals doesn't really shift much, even with a, a large increase of individuals going into the population in 2016. And the percentage of prevalence um, with the disease itself hasn't changed either. And that's because this is in fact a frequency uh, dependent disease and not a dependent disease. 
So the next question then is what can you use genetics for once you have a really keen understanding of what's happening within the population itself? Uh, and Kate Farquharson and Elspeth McLennan, again from our research group, undertook a study taking genetic samples from all across uh, Tasmania as well as Mariah Island and the insurance population. And so what we found is this is very distinct um, genetic differentiation, clinal di genetic differentiation that goes all the way from uh, northeastern Tasmania through the central region and up into the west coast. And that the southwest animals down here in the bottom uh, south corner are very distinctly different from the other animals. <laughs> when we look at the insurance pop metapopulation, we can see that the insurance population is really representative of the wild, um, gene wild genetic diversity, except for these uh, very extreme areas up here in the northwest, uh, northeast of the state, sorry, where the disease started, and down here in the southwest. What we also showed for the first time is there's actually a lot more fine genetic structuring across the species range than we originally anticipated, and we've been able to separate it into these six genetic clusters. And as you can see, the insurance population in Mariah Island truly represent the genetic structuring we see in the wild. So where does this leave us now? So how do we maintain gene flow of some wild populations? And these are the questions for the Tasmanian gov the government will need to be working on in the future with their long-term monitoring plan. But what we've been able to do is provide a range of different tools and techniques, which can hopefully allow us to see Tasmanian devils run wild permanently in Tasmania. So thank you very much for joining us today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the online course and I take uh, time moment to acknowledge all the contributors to TSI. Thank you.